Hello, and welcome to another Farbank Fly Fishing School episode. In this episode, I'm going to dig deep into dry fly fishing skills for the river trout angler. Dry fly fishing for trout is seen as the pinnacle of fly fishing experiences by many anglers due to the extra skills needed to be consistently successful. In addition, many say that the visual aspect of a trout taking the dry fly off the surface is the most rewarding thing in fly fishing. So without further ado, let's take a look at just how you fish a dry fly in a river and see what the fuss is all about. And just to remind you, when you're out on the water, make sure you have your appropriate fishing licenses and know the regulations and seasons. The first thing we should look at is what is a dry fly? You want to go dry fly fishing? You better know what a dry fly is. And it's pretty simple. A dry fly is a fly that floats. It stays on the surface of the water, doesn't go underwater. Fish feed on dry flies in the natural world and you'll see heads coming up and fish eating things off the surface and splashes and that's indicative that they are feeding on the surface. And so you fish a fly that floats, hence the name dry fly. And there's lots of different types. First type we're gonna look at are the flies that are born underwater and they swim up to the surface when it's time to hatch out and they crawl out of the skin and they sit on the surface of the water for a few seconds and the fish eat them off the surface. And these are types of flies like midges, tiny little midges. That's a fly that floats, sits on the water. You have flies called caddis. That's another type of fly that sits on the surface of the water. They crawl out of the water, sit on the surface. We have giant things like stoneflies, and we have beloved things of the, of the dry fly angler called mayflies. So all of those are born underwater, swim up to the surface and float down when they're ready to hatch out. And that's when you fish a dry fly. But those aren't the only kind of flies and the only kind of time when you fish dry flies like that because sometimes you get what's called terrestrials. And terrestrials are insects that are born on land and kind of blow onto the water. Natural insects like grasshoppers. They go on the water. Beetles, ants, fish love ants. When ants fall on the water, fish eat them. So those are called terrestrials. And again, in those situations, you'd fish a dry fly type pattern. And then sometimes you just like dry fly fishing and sometimes there's no fish feeding. And so you still want to catch fish on a dry fly. And in those situations, you fish attractor patterns, searching patterns, patterns that really aren't representative of insects, but the fish just still eat them. Things like this, this is a chubby Chernobyl. It doesn't look like any kind of insect, but it searches the water and fish for whatever reason, come up and grab them out of the blue. So dry flies really are these highly floating flies. They sit on the surface of the water, they float down, fish eat them, and that's really what dry flies are. Now, what you need to do is why and when would you fish a dry fly? So let's take a look at that in the next chapter. The simplest reason to fish dry flies is because you look at the water, you walk up, you study the water carefully and a fish rises. Oh, fish just took a fly off the surface. That's a pretty obvious giveaway that fish are looking for flies on the surface. And then you see that fish does it again and it comes up another time. That's really good. What you don't really want to look for are the fish that are called the oncers, the fish that come up and feed once and you go, oh look, and then it never comes back again. You want the persistent rises. So kind of watch the water, watch what's happening in the water, Look for fish that are feeding off the surface. Look for either the head comes out and the roll, fish rolls like that, or you might see a little splash, you might see a little dimple. There's lots of different forms that that eat takes when a fish grabs a fly off the surface of the water. But basically you're looking for disturbance in the surface film, and that shows you the fish are feeding off the surface. And then when you get into it, what you'll find is that you, you can fish the Bugs that are hatching out on the water, as I said, they come up, they sit on the surface of the water, drying their wings out for a few seconds. That's when fish really focus on them. And when you get lots of bugs coming out, lots of rises, that's called a hatch. And a hatch is an excellent time of, of, of the day to go fishing because there's lots of bugs and there's lots of feeding fish. 
But again, it doesn't have to be just these waterborne bugs, right? You can have the terrestrials, talked about that in the previous chapter. You can have your grasshoppers, you can have your ants, you can have your beetles. Fish love ants and beetles, and you might find that there's a puff of wind, it blows a bunch of grasshoppers on the water or some ants, and the fish start feeding on those. So again, it doesn't have to be the hatches that mean you fish dry flies. And even to the point of, of people are so addicted and so enjoy dry fly fishing, me being one of these guilty party, that I will sit on the water and watch a bit of water where I think there's fish and just wait, wait for a fish to rise. That, that visual, the elation of seeing a fish rise and then you positioning yourself and tying on the right bug and targeting, there's a lot of satisfaction in that. So a lot of people just don't even need a hatch, they'll just wait and, and fish selectively just when that fish rises, or they'll fish one of those searching patterns and the attractor patterns just because dry fly fishing is so much fun. So assume you've got all that and you get to the water and say, I want to be a dry fly fisherman, and you want to select the bug. Well, if you're a beginner at this thing, let's keep it really simple. There's a brown small bug and it floats down and the fish eats it. Guess what you put on? A brown small bug. You go to a box, you find a little bug that's small and brown, you tie it on, and you're probably gonna catch a fish. And as you get into this sport, you're gonna understand that there become hatches and different times of the day, certain hatches. There's a fly called a pale morning done. Probably hatches in the morning. There's a pale evening done. Probably hatches in the evening. There's a caddis, generally hatches in the evening. So as you get into it, you'll understand the timings of certain hatches and you'll go down with your caddis box in the evening because you enjoy caddis fishing or you'll fish your PMDs or pale morning duns because you like fishing PMDs. So that's it. Dry fly fishing is pretty simple. Find your fly, find your fish that's feeding, chuck it out there. And now we need to talk a little bit about what do you chuck it out there with. So let's take a little look at the rest of the gear you need to fly fish with dry flies. You don't technically need any special gear for dry fly fishing. But a lot of people, as I said, they get into it. They, they love it. And dry fly fishing becomes the drug and that's all they want to do. So when dry fly fishing becomes that important to you, you probably want to get some more specialized equipment. The first thing to look at is your rod. You generally want a rod that is going to be slightly slower in action, a little softer rod. That's because you're going to fish light leaders and tippet. We'll talk about that in a second. And these softer rods give you a bit more shock of protection on those light leaders and tippets. So generally a slightly slower action rod is good, or maybe a lighter rod. Instead of fishing the standard five weight, you might go down to a four weight rod, and that also helps out a little bit by being a little bit more protective of those light tippets. You obviously need a reel. Doesn't really change. A reel is nothing special in dry fly fishing. You can get away with most fly lines in dry fly fishing, but again, if you're specializing in dry fly fishing, you probably want a specialty dry fly type line. Here's one. This is a technical trout. And what makes this a specialty dry fly line is when you turn the box around and you kind of read the shape of the line on the back, what's called the profile, you'll notice it has a front taper. That's the important thing. You want a front taper that's really long. You want the fly as far away from the weight of the fly line as possible. And this one has a 10 foot front taper, which is a pretty good dry fly line. When you look at other lines, they might have a four foot taper or a three foot taper, and they will land just too heavy on the water and they'll probably scare most of your fish away. So don't touch those lines. Where it really dials in is in your leader choice. Your standard leaders for most trout angling is gonna be a nine foot 5X. That's kind of a go-to leader that most anglers use for pretty well everything. And whilst that's a great dry fly leader, well, there are times when you need your fly to be further away from the visibility and the impact of your fly line landing on the water. And so in those situations, you're probably gonna extend your leader. You could go to a 12 foot leader, that's quite a bit longer, so your fly is further away from your, from your fly line, that's a good thing to note. You could go to a 15 foot leader, again, you're just longer. Again, taking the fly further away from the impact of your fly line. So keep that in mind when you're dry fly fishing. You generally want a longer, longer leader for that reason. But in addition to length, you also want a leader that's a little bit thinner. The thinner the leader is, the more natural movement the fly will have in the water with all the currents and the subtleties of those currents. So you want a very much thinner leader. 
And also you have small flies and you can't tie a small fly onto a fat bit of leader. So as you get into your leader materials, instead of the 5X we talked about, you might go down to a 6X. That's a really thin leader material. You can see this is three pound in strength, that's 6X. You might even go down to a 7X with really tiny flies. You have to fish 7X, A to thread them on and B to present the most natural drifts. So as you get into dry fly fishing, you are gonna to need to focus more on a bit more specialty items in terms of your rod, reels, and lines, particularly if this becomes a focus and a drug to you. And while that's your essentials, your rod, your reel, and your line, the dry fly angler needs a couple of other little accessories. The first accessory is kind of some kind of floatant. This is a silicon goo. And when you fish a dry fly and you tie your dry fly on the end of your line and you cast it out, after a few casts, that dry fly absorbs water and starts to sink, and it doesn't become a dry fly. And so, what do you want to do? Well, you want to waterproof it. So a, a fly floatant's really essential. All you do is you take a little bead of this and squeeze it onto your finger and rub it into the feathers, and that'll waterproof the dry fly and make it float a lot longer. So that's a really good thing to have as a dry fly angler. But in addition to that, eventually that fly will get waterlogged and will sink, and you need to dry it out. And what you want for that is some kind of desiccant powder. It's not like a snake in a, in a jar here, but it's not. It's a powder that's a desiccant. It sucks out moisture. So when you've got your dry flies and you're fishing your dry flies and you can no longer see them because they're waterlogged and sink, well, then all you do is you pull your dry fly in, shake it in this little shake. That sucks the moisture out and it's good as new and it's riding high and floating up in the water again. So really, in a nutshell, that is a summary of the basic gear you need as a, as a dry fly angler, particularly if you specifically want to target and fish the dry fly. And once you've got your gear assembled, well, you've got to tie your dry fly on and rig it up. And there's a couple of great little rigs I'm going to show you in the next chapter on how to set up a dry fly. The simplest rig you can use is pretty simple. You tie a dry fly onto the end of the leader of choice, and there it is. There's a small brown fly in the water, you find a small brown fly and tie it on. No flies on the water, you put on a searching pattern or an attractor like this chubby chobin noble, and off you go. That is a standard, simple, very easy to set up rig. But sometimes you want a little bit more of an edge. And in those situations, for example, you might set up a tandem rig. Now here's a lovely tandem rig. I fish this one a lot. I love to fish tandem rigs. I've got two flies here. I've got a small fly on here, it's called a PMD, and I've got a larger fly on here called a Caddis. And you might fish a pattern like that because more than one fly is on the water. You might have many types of bugs in the water. So you're covering your bases by fishing more than one fly. You can see I've got an arm hanging down with one fly on, that's called a dropper. And then I've got my caddis on this fly, right hanging down here. So that's a great setup. But check your rules. Before you go fishing with two flies, don't get arrested for poaching because you're only allowed to fish one fly. Make sure you're allowed to fish one fly or two flies or three flies before you go out into the water. And one really good application of that tandem rig is when you're fishing very, very small flies. You get to the water and you see there's tiny flies in the water and a fish are feeding on them. So you put on your tiny fly and you cast your tiny fly out and it sits on the water and you can't see it. And fish are feeding away. You have no idea if a fish has taken your fly or not because you can't see your fly. So what's called a sighter rig is very simply where you have your tiny fly and on the end of the tiny fly, fairly close to the tiny fly, you fish a bigger fly and this bigger fly is your sighter. So you watch that bigger fly on the water, and if a fish rises somewhere close to it, roughly where you think that distance is, where that fly is, you're just gonna set the hook. So sight is an excellent, excellent way to set up when you're fishing on the water with really, really small flies. And those are your main rigs that you go out dry fly fishing with that I think, certainly that I have most confidence in that I fish the most of. One little tip on that, which I would definitely suggest you do, is when you get to the water and you've rigged everything up, don't just start fishing straight away. What you'll find is when you've taken your leader out of the bag, your fresh, nice leader, taking it out of the bag, you'll see there's quite a coily memory set to it like this, big squiggly thing. And that's not good for a couple of things, energy transfer and casting and for setting the hook. So before you start fishing, I would highly recommend that you just get the butt section like this, give it a nice hard pull, pull out the memory, straighten that leader, and then do the same with the next section and straighten all the memory out. And that leader will cast better and fish better and give you a slightly better chance of hooking the fish. 
That's it, really, that's all there is. Some basic rigs there for you to go out with, get, understand what to set up when you go out dry fly fishing. So now, let's get down to the water and look at what to do when you arrive at the river to fish a dry fly. So we're rigged up. We're at the water. We're ready to go fishing with a dry fly. Here I am on the Missouri River, one of the most legendary dry fly fisheries in the US, without any shadow of a doubt. Love this fishery. A couple of tips about uh, before you just blunder in and start fishing is you've got a, a three-step approach to find fish. The first thing I recommend you do is wherever a bit of water you drive up to or walk in or get out at, just stand back and watch. Watch a couple of hundred yards section. Watch to the left and the middle. Watch to the right. Watch the slow water and the quick water. And you're just trying to find some rising fish. Dry fly fishing is much more effective if you find rising fish. And once you pinpoint a location of those rising fish, then you start to walk carefully along the bank until you're within striking distance of those fish. And then you wait, that's your second wait. Wait from the bank, watch them again, make sure your movement hasn't spooked them, make sure they are where you think they are. Have a look at the size of the fish, are they little fish, are they big fish? Once you're satisfied the fish are still there, now you take a wading approach to get into a casting distance. That obviously depends how far you cast, but the most important thing about wading is you wade so carefully at this stage. You wade, you don't want any ripples, and you most certainly want to listen as you wade, and you don't want to hear lots of splashing. You want to hear nothing. You want to wade so quietly, not pushing out any ripples, because fish will feel those ripples and push off. And once you get into that position that you've kind of got an idea, I'm within casting range of the fish, there's your third wait. You wait till they start rising again. And that just confirms that you know exactly where the fish is, and you've got your fish are still there, they haven't spooked, and gives you a rough idea of the size of them. So that's really how you approach the water. And once you're in that position, ready to cast to those fish, now you've got to identify the exact position those fish are in. And that is something we need to talk about. So you're in position, there's a few fish arising around you and you might be tempted to make that first cast immediately and try and catch one, because we want to do that. But hold your horses. You've got patience is the name of the game with dry fly fishing. First thing I recommend you do is watch the rise form and deduce whether they're big fish or little fish. That'll help you just target big fish because we all want to catch big fish. Generally speaking, the big fish are very confident. They feed slowly. They don't come up in haste, they feed slowly. When they take something off the surface, you're, there's hardly a ripple. They're very, very subtle rises, no splash. The little ones are much more hasty, like teenage kids, and they come up and just splash at it and grab, and you see splashes and lots of rings, and you could be tempted to think, oh, big splash means big fish. Well, this is the opposite. Those subtle rises, those slow, confident rises are the big fish. Once you've found the big fish, the next thing to do is really fix its location in your mind, in your visual mind, because you might look down to tie a fly or something and then look up and quite have lost its position. So again, before you make that first cast, find either a stick on the far bank that is opposite, you say, oh, it's opposite that blade of grass or it's opposite that, that stick or opposite that tree, gives you a good idea, or better still, find a reflection that is right where the rings emanate from. You'll find the reflection of a, a tree or a rock or something like that. Because again, when you look away and look back, the reflection hasn't moved and the fish might not be feeding, but you know the exact spot. So those are really, really useful tips. And the reason I say that is because a lot of novice dry fly fishers don't understand that the, the place that the fish will take the fly is an exact spot almost all the time. And the fish will come up and take a fly in this spot and then the rings, as they spread out, those rings float down river. And if you analyze the rings down here and you go, oh, this is where the rise is, and you cast at this spot here, well, you're not landing a fly in the spot for where the rings emanate from. So watch out for the rings floating downstream. Always try and find the spot where the rings emanate from, because that's the taking spot for the fish. And really, that's it. Now, the last thing you've got to do is understand where to cast the fly to get the best chance of catching a fish. So here we are, ready to catch a fish, do you think? <laughs> Nearly. Remember, patience is so important when dry fly fishing. Before you make that cast, that first cast, you know where the fish are rising, you know where they're lying, you know where the big one is, just quickly glance behind you and make sure there isn't a tree because we have all done that. In the haste to get a fish, you make that first cast, snag the tree behind you, and boy, is that a disappointing experience. 
So look behind you, make sure the tree's not gonna hook anything. Next thing you wanna do is look at the current line, the line that leads directly to that point where the rise emanates from. It might have a curve to it because there might be a curve in the current, but watch it because your fly should land in that same path so it drifts naturally right over that emanation point. Huge benefit to watch that and understand that. And the last little thing I'd look for, just kind of look for beds of weed or floating bits of weed or sticks or something like that that might just affect the drift or your line might lie over. In other words, just be prepared when you're ready to make that first cast. And everything I've said up to this point applies to all forms of dry fly fishing in a river. Now, we're just gonna separate it. You can fish a dry fly upstream and you can fish a dry fly downstream in a river. So let's take a look at fishing a dry fly upstream and how to do exactly that. Of those two techniques, probably the most common is fishing the dry fly upstream. Simply, you cast it against the current and let it wash towards you. And a couple of things to observe about that is, first of all, where should you stand? Well, the first thing is you should stand within a nice, easy, comfortable casting range where you know you can make an accurate, gentle presentation cast. Don't try for a hero cast, not with these fish. Get a comfortable, spend a little more time getting into position, make a comfortable cast where you can be accurate and also control the distance. When you make that cast, you wanna make sure that your cast lands about two feet upstream of where the emanation point of the feeding fish is. And any further than that, it's really hard to get a drift over that fish at the natural speed. And so you've got to make sure your drift is going to be perfect and that is going to be achieved by landing your fly within a couple of feet of that emanation point. And as you do this, when you cast your dry fly upstream, you're going to have to retrieve the line to keep straight. You're going to get an eat. Trust me, it's going to happen. And when you do get an eat, you need to set the hook. If you're just watching the fly and doing nothing, you're going to have a pile of slack under your rod. And when you go to set the hook, you miss it because there's too much slack. So when your line lands, immediately start pulling in, keep a tight line between you and the fly. If you see your line drifting to the sideways because there's currents and things like that, then you're gonna to need to lift up and throw a mend into that. And that's gonna alter the, the path and the drag of the fly and make it, keep it fishing normally again. If you don't know what a mend is, check back to our basic river fishing techniques episode and you'll see all about how to make a mend there. And then once you've got the drift right and you've got the mend right, you're gonna get a few casts over the fish. And the last thing you wanna do is, once your fly has passed the fish, is lift up and spook the fish, because it's gone. You've got all this work into getting into the right position and you've spooked the fish with some dumb error like that. Well, don't. When you make that cast and your fly goes over the fish, let your fly wash her eight or 10 feet past it before you pick it up again. That ensures you're not gonna spook it and gives you a better chance of that fish still being there. Now, a dry fly floats. It's on the water floating. You're trying to imitate a natural insect on the surface of the water. And so what you've got to do is, after a few casts, you'll find your fly will probably get a little bit waterlogged. It might even start sinking. So between each cast, you want to do two or three false casts, drying the feathers off and then lay it down. And then the next cast, two or three false casts, drying the feathers off and lay it down. And if it keeps sinking after that, just reapply a bit more floatant to that fly so it stays up again. And that floating fly is really essential to get these eats because the fish are feeding on the surface. And then once you've got the, the, the fly floating and you've got five or six casts out there and you haven't got a grab, you're going to start doubting things. Is it the right fish? Is it the right fly? Am I getting the right drift? You know, what do you do next? Because there'll be plenty of times when you're not going to catch the fish you're aiming for, sadly. Well, my rule of thumb is I like to get five drifts that I consider perfect over that fish. No drag, right down the center of the current seam, landed in the right place. And if I've got five casts that are dead right and the fish is still happy and still feeding away, then I'm gonna change my fly. Now it might take a hundred casts to get five good ones, but if the fish is still happy and feeding, you can do that. You might take five casts, in which case you're changing your fly 10 times a day, but you'll be get rewarded because one time you're gonna find the fly that that fish wants. So really those are your kind of keys to that. And then the last little thing to, to dry fly fishing is, is probably the most obvious thing I probably don't need to tell you about, but hey, we want to keep this complete chapter on dry fly fishing. And that is, how do you know when a fish has eaten your fly? And why it's obvious? Because you're looking at right at the fly. Don't be looking at eagles and talking to your buddy over there. Look at the fly, 
watch it float down. And when you see a fish take a fly, you know it has, so you set the hook. And the simple rule of thumb of hook setting, the slower the water, the slower the lift set, and in fast water, the quicker your snatch is. You can also kind of watch the rise as you get more experience. A splashy rise usually means a quick hook set and a slow, confident rise from a big trout usually means a slow hook set. So that's upstream dry fly fishing. It's a great successful technique. As I said, it's probably the commonest way of fishing dry flies in the, in, in the river. But there is one other way we want to talk about, and that is fishing the dry fly downstream. The dry fly fish downstream is probably my favorite way of fishing of all. Now, why would you fish it downstream, first of all? Well, targeting big fish is a good one. Big fish are pretty spooky. And when you cast a dry fly from below the fish upstream, your fly lands above the fish and your leader and fly line lands close to the fish. You can spook a lot of fish doing that. So when you fish a dry fly downstream, you cast your fly above the fish and all your leader and fly line lands above the fish. It doesn't land in front of the fish. So you can get a lot bigger fish that way. Almost always when I've, I'm targeting a big fish, if I can get in the position, I will fish downstream to it rather than upstream to it. Perhaps another reason fish downstream dry fly is that you just physically can't stand in the spot to fish upstream dry fly. Maybe there's a deep hole, maybe there's a tree, maybe something. But in other words, the only way you can stand to fish this fish is from above it. That's why you fish the downstream dry fly. Now the dry fly downstream is no different from the dry fly upstream. Right? You want to get a natural drift. You want to make sure you stand in a position you want to find your targets, whatever fish are feeding. You want to look at the line of current that's going to take that fly over it. And you want to stand in a position that's going to give you a nice cast. So make sure you spend a little bit of time wading into range, nice and slowly, carefully, so you can make a good cast, rather than try your maximum distance and mess it up and get a bad cast and spook the fish. You want to get to an angle where you're upstream of the fish, but slightly to one side. And the reason is that you don't need mud that you're knocking up to travel down and scare the fish. You want to be slightly to one side. And generally speaking, you want to cast and land your dry fly something like about two feet in front of where that fish's rise is emanating. If it's rising here, I'm going to land my fly about two feet above it in the right current line, and the line will wash the fly straight over the fish. And <laughs> with luck, we're going to get an eat. Now, there's a bit more to it than luck. The hardest thing with fishing a dry fly downstream is you've got to get a natural drift. And the only way you're going to do that fishing downstream is you've got to create slack. As long as your line is slack, it's going to just drift with the current and your fly will have a lovely drift. So the first step is you make a cast and make your fly line land with slack on the water. There's a number of options on that. There's a cast called a parachute cast, which is a cast that stops with a high rod. There's a cast where you wiggle the rod side to side and you create slack and you create slack when it lands and that gives you a nice lot of slack. And if you don't know those casts, check out our episode on other useful river casts. It shows you how to do these casts and why. You need those casts. You need to generate slack when your fly lands. But in addition to that, you also need to feed out slack. If your current is going at three miles an hour, you want to give your line at three miles an hour. And that gives you a nice natural drift past the fish. So you get a natural flow to the fly and then the fish will be pretty happy to take that. And really that's all there is to fishing the dry fly downstream. But one perhaps word of warning, something I've done many times and I've, hopefully I've learned by now, is you don't want to spook the fish. When a fish is rising here and for some reason the fish doesn't take your dry fly and your dry fly floats past the fish, the worst thing you can do is pick your fly up aggressively straight away from when your fly is close to the fish. Let your fly drift six or seven feet past where that fish is feeding and be very cautious on your pickup, a nice, slow, gentle pickup. And then you know you haven't scared that fish and is there for another attempt. So really, that's the downstream dry fly fishing. As I said, it's my favorite technique because I think you can target and get bigger fish with that way. It takes a little bit more discipline. You've got to control the slack and you've got to control the angle of your line and your cast, but it's a lot more fun and I think you get a lot better fish that way. And really, that's all there is to fishing a dry fly in a river. Whether you fish the dry fly or upstream or downstream, that's entirely up to you. But whichever way you do, there's a couple of last pointers to remember. One, the slack. You've got to have slack to get a natural drift of your fly over the fish. But control that slack. Never have too much slack so that when you try to set the hook, all you're doing is pulling slack and not setting the hook. 
So control your slack. Number two, expect the eat. You know where the fish is, you've been watching it. It's feeding, you know it's emanation point, you know your fly is here, you see your fly getting to that emanation point. Expect it to eat every single time. It won't. You have plenty of times you'll be utterly disappointed. But the worst thing you can do is not expect it to eat and it eats and you go, oh my God, it ate and you completely miss it because you're surprised. So expect that eat. When you do get that eat, remember, you've got to control the speed of the hook set. Usual rule of thumb, slower the water, the slower the lift and hook set. And in fast water, the quicker your snatch should be or quicker your hook set should be. And when it all comes together and you hook a fish and you land a fish and you admire this beautiful fish that you've caught on the dry fly and you put this fish back and you see more fish rising and you go, oh, I want to catch more fish. This is so addictive. The last thing you want to do is retreat your fly so it floats again. The fish slime makes the fly sink. So generally what you want to do is wash the fly in the water, get the slime off, retreat it with a bit of your fly floatant, do a couple of false casts to dry the feathers off and then start the whole process all over again. Get into position, make the cast, expect the eat, catch another fish. <laughs> That's dry fly fishing. I love it. I hope you love it. I hope you get out to the Missouri here and, and enjoy dry fly fishing or wherever you go, enjoy fishing dry flies on rivers for trout. So there you have it, the core techniques and tactics that you as a fly fisher should know in order to become a successful dry fly angler. Hopefully you've learned enough in this episode to approach the river with confidence and know what to do when fish are rising. As always, I want to end this episode with a friendly reminder to do your part in keeping the river clean and the fish healthy. Look after the environment, leave no trace of your visit to the water and treat the fish you catch with the utmost respect. I hope you enjoyed this episode and also hope to see you on the water one day putting your newfound skills to good use. Thanks a lot for watching.